the son of uh, uh, first generation immigrants, and I was lucky enough to come here, you know, at an early age. So, you know, my English is pretty good. I got the accent down and everything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you got smooth flow. I'll tell you that. <laughs> smooth flow. But um, what I what I noticed predominantly talking to people of Asian South Asian um, heritage is that when immigrants come here, there's and you talked about this capital consumer culture that uh, when immigrants come here, they're predominantly like, all they're thinking about is money. So they'll always push their kids into like technical fields, Microsoft, engineering, doctor. Um, I saw an Indian movie which illustrated this pretty well where the, the, the main character, he was a dean, and if he had a daughter, she would become a doctor, and if he had a son, he would become an engineer. And those are the only two things that you know he laid out for his children. It was a movie, but it illustrated a point. Um, the other thing is, just again to illustrate, is like I went to my dentist uh, a week ago, and uh, I just met him for the first time. He's like, "So what do you do?" I'm like, "I go to college." He's like, "What classes are you taking?" "Oh, I'm taking sociology and psychology." And he's like, "Oh, so you don't want a job?" So, <laughs> wow. And, yeah, he was this like old white guy. Um, he, he's a pretty nice guy. I like him. But, <laughs> but the point is, the point is that there is. I hope he's a better dentist than he is in Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> No, go right here. Yeah. I, I couldn't. The, I couldn't hold it in. Go right here. The point. <laughs> the point is, there's this huge push, especially in Asian South Asian communities and immigrant communities, to like go for some. Especially even someone like you, when they hear Princeton, Harvard, Yale, they're like, you know, if you want to be like Dr. West, you have to go to those schools, or you have to do this, and you can only become an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer or something like that. And so when I tell them these things, it's kind of like, oh, you're doing that, you know. So um, I just wanted to get your take that how. How do you fill that gap? How do you talk and communicate to people, especially if they haven't lived here, they haven't uh, consumed right, the culture, right, they're, they're just right. kind of fresh, and there's this disconnect between immigrant parents and their children because they don't know who, uh, they can't relate to each other on that level. So if I want to be like that bridge or if I want to uh, do that, like, what is a good way of communicating that kind of message that, you know, maybe I don't have to become an engineer or a doctor? Mm, no, I appreciate that question. I mean, one is that, uh, being self-critical does presuppose not simply the freedom to ask questions, but also the freedom to act based on the answers you, you provide to those questions. <coughs> and so you got to tell loved ones, mom, dad, I appreciate the rich consultation, but in the end, I'm not asking for your permission as to who I love, what I do with my vocation, but I'll always be true to the love you gave me. There's a difference between consultation and permission. See what I mean? So you say, I've been called to be a poet, and I might be broke as the Ten Commandments financially, but that's what I'm going to do. That's my calling. What have you been called to do? I've been called to be an engineer. That's a beautiful thing. Nothing wrong with being an engineer. That's your calling. Probably the finest philosophic mind who emerged out of continental Europe was an engineer. His name was Ludwig Wittgenstein. Another novelist who was an engineer. His name was Norman Mailer, graduated from Harvard in aer aeronautical engineering. He was a fine engineer. We don't know him for his engineering. Well, his literary work was a kind of engineering, but we know him for his novels and his nonfiction. You see what I mean? So you don't know which way. Well, you, oh, you want to be a doctor? Oh, my favorite literary artist of all time was a medical doctor, his name was Anton Chekhov. <laughs> Nobody like him. He's a blues man and never heard the American blues from Russia. Medical doctor during the day, writing plays and short stories at night. That's not your ordinary medical doctor. But he was first and foremost. You ask him, what are you? I'm a medical doctor. I believe in healing bodies. But you're healing some souls too, brother, in your literature, in the Cherry Archer and Uncle Vanya and so forth. So you, you get away from the stereotypes. You know what I mean? But, you, but it's the freedom. That's, and that takes courage. You know? It's courage to tell your, your mother and so forth, sacrifice for you and so on. All this time I've been wrestling for you to be an engineer. It could have it had his brother Wolf, his blessed mother. I want you to be an engineer. I'm going to be dean, provost, president, and still be an engineer. <laughs> Ooh, mom, let me break it down to you. This is I'm following what you taught me to be myself, even though it may not be necessarily expectation. I'm not saying that was her expectation, because I know she's a complicated sister. But the thing is, that, that, that's, that's part of the freedom connected to the love. And the two are tied, the radical love and freedom, and the radical freedom in love. 
and it's very difficult. And it's, this is true, you know, with our gay brothers and lesbian sisters, right? How are you going to explain to, to your parents that you're a lesbian sister? It might violate their expectations. Mom, you taught me how to love. It's just going this way. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Bible says so. so. Well, what did Jesus say? Not a word, not a mumbling word. I was there a lot of things. Pre Copernican, Earth is flat. <laughs> you still believe that? <laughs> no. Love thy neighbor. Be fundamentalist about that one. <laughs> Be fundamentalist about loving thy neighbor as thyself. Be fundamentalist about Micah <laughs> and Amos. Oh, yeah, be fundamentalist about that one. What's Amos talking about? Justice rolled down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. What do you think about that line? Well, uh, yeah, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Maybe charity rolling down, no philanthropy rolling down, no justice. That's where that freedom comes in vis-a-vis -vis our loved ones. We can do that even as we still love them deeply, you know, very much so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Go right ahead. Dr. West, yeah. how you doing? How you doing, my brother? Good to my see you. My name is Rudy Mondragon, and... Um, yeah, I just want to let you know that I'm not as a fan, but as a person that's been journeying with you in this movement, so I just wanted to say appreciate your work. Did um, we talk last night? No, I, t I hit you up in Oregon when I was there at the oh, yes, Real Justice Conference. Yeah, yeah. Talked exactly. to you about healing. I, I, I could tell. Look, yeah, I yeah I'm glad you remember me. Yeah. I'm going to get some coffee after this. Anyway. <laughs> 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 so my question is uh, situated around uh, mental colonization and um, education, since we're talking about education, since we're in the space of education, higher education specifically. Uh, what you said about white supremacy, um, not just as a racial thing, as a physical thing, but as an ideology, is important, I think, and it's something that gets um, not discussed too much. Um, and we, I think we need to decolonize it and talk about it more. Um, it's something that's taught, it's forced, and sometimes embraced willingly by our brothers and sisters. Um, and we see it heading, um, we see the SATs heading in that direction where white supremacy is present in the SAT, where the essay portion where students can express themselves subjectively, mm -hmm. implicate themselves in the essay, express themselves in who they are, might be banned and eliminated, or at least the SATs moving in that direction. You know, the test is a uh, test assimilation, it does a test wisdom, right? Absolutely. We see white supremacy in our college admissions practices. We see white supremacy in the curriculum. We see it all on all fronts, and so can you provide some in-depth uh, analysis or talk a little bit about the necessary steps that we need to take in what you talked about in killing it, and providing death to this idea of white supremacy that has gone and crossed racial lines and is now embraced and is practiced, is recycled, is perpetuated on all fronts in education specifically, and what do we need to do to heal, to uh, decolonize our faculty, our staff, our students, and heal. Oh, and that's a very crucial process, very much so. I think part of it has to do with being uh, very explicit about the major thinkers, scholars, writers who have radically called into question all the various, various forms of white supremacy. W.B. Du Bois, Black Reconstruction, 1935, we wrestle with it. Eric Foner, probably the finest living American historian that we know, building on W.B. Du Bois and Reconstruction, or David Bryan Davis, or C.L.R. James, or Toni Morris, and there's a whole host of voices who constitute a tradition that do exactly what you're talking about. And therefore, you bring it to your teachers, your scholars, your educators. What are you going to do with this tradition of all of these various writings? that are radically calling this into question. What are you going to do with James Baldwin? Read and find next time, unsettling and calling into question any kind of white supremacist conception of self, community, and so forth. Now, that's one thing at the intellectual level. Execution is always different because you have to deal with the operations of power in institutions and structures. That's much slower. But we have more and more in our armor. I mean, if we were around in the 1950s, where well, we did have an intellectual tradition, but not as strong because so many of our universities themselves were caught. I mean, we're talking about Princeton. Princeton's a magnificent place, but Princeton was the northernmost post of the Confederacy. And so you didn't go to Princeton to get a critique of white supremacy. <laughs> you went to Princeton in order to gain access to the privilege of a white supremacist regime. Woodrow Wilson, president of Princeton, what did he do? He 
resegregated Washington, D.C., is out of Virginia. All Virginia is not white supremacists, but they got a whole host of them at that time especially, you see. So that some of these universities with unbelievable authority can have paradigms and frameworks that need to be Socratized, radically called into question. And yet these same universities now, like under Shirley and others, she ended up with what? One of the best Afro-American studies department, not because I was there, but because Toni Morrison was there, Arnold Ramstadt was there, Eddie Glaude was there, a whole new wave of voices critical of white supremacy at the very height. And that's true for, for the others, Chicago, Dartmouth, where our dear brother went to undergrad, and Stanford, and so forth and so on, and University of Washington here. You got voices. You got Sister Cheryl. What, what's our dear sister's name that ranks for multicultural education? Cheryl, is it Cheryl McGee? Jerry Banks. Give that sister a hand. Give that sister a hand. She's doing very important work. Very important work. And I was reading about this brother, uh, Dan Berger. Is that his name, Dan Berger, who writes on the, on the prison system? Yeah. Give that brother a hand. He's doing some very important work. Very important work. He's teaching right in the, right in the with the counter voices and so on, you know? And that's part of a tradition, too, in that sense. And we have to, we have to acknowledge and, and, and affirm those kind of courageous voices, but I hear what you're saying. I know I'm gonna have to cut back on my length because I don't know when, what time it is. What time is it getting to be right now? What time y'all got? 10.55? Oh, we got a good time, no, okay. No, no, because we're gonna break some laws on this highway to get back to, uh, <laughs> I can get to Berkeley.